In this episode of the podcast, we're talking to Jason Vinson of Vinson Images. Now, Vinson Images is an Arkansas-based wedding and portrait photography duo composed of husband and wife, Jason and Chasney Vinson. Now, these two are absolutely incredible photographers. Their work has garnered more awards than you can possibly imagine and a following from around the world. We're going to talk to Jason about their approach to photography, their inspiration, kind of how they actually go about shooting. We'll be talking a bit about Jason's kind of new approach to family documentary work. It's going to be a great episode, so let's jump in. This is the TSS Podcast. It's a place for authentic conversations to uncover the stupid simple truths that help us succeed in business, create better relationships, and lead more fulfilling lives. Welcome to Think Stupid Simple. Yes, my friend, I have, uh, I just got off a episode with Miles. Now, I don't know if it's going to be, you know, you know, when it's going to be broadcast, Uh, but yes, I just did an episode. Miles is a cool guy. I like him. I just found out he lives like down the street from you. Yeah, he lives like probably 10 minutes away from me. Did you guys end up doing that coffee? The what? <laughs> he said <laughs> He said in his that you reached out at some point and said um, we should do coffee. And then you guys did coffee. I don't know. Maybe, probably. <laughs> Was he lying to me? Was he lying about coffee? I, I I need to know I need to know the context. I think he said he mentioned that you reached out early in your career and said um, I or maybe it was later on where you're like, I always wanted to ask you to go to coffee. And then he, but I was, you know, I didn't whatever. And then he said, oh, oh we should gotcha, just go gotcha, do gotcha, coffee okay. tomorrow. No, I think whenever I first started shooting, I was like looking up other photographers in the area and just trying to like build a network. And this is before um, I knew that there was even like photography Facebook groups and my business was even, I think I had like a free Wix page for my photography business and stuff like that. And so I was just kind of reaching out to like other photographers in the area. And I was like, Hey, do you want to go shoot? You want to go do some like street photography on campus? And no, 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 no. Like all the big photographers are like people that actually had like full running business were like, who is this guy? Like, get out of here. No, I'm not going to need you for to go shoot street photography on campus. <laughs> <laughs> just to go do some street photography. Is that, yeah. is that kind of what you like to shoot early on was street photos? Um, that was like what I'd love to shoot outside of paid stuff. So like, I love, I love shooting engagement shoots and weddings and stuff like that. I'm not a fan of like newborns and families. I, uh, I changed that. Um, I'm now beginning to enjoy family sessions and especially, um, uh, we've started to offer like family documentary sessions. Um, and so I do love that, but like I quickly learned that maternity shoots and stuff like that. Well, newborns, especially not my cup of tea. Um, but like to go out and shoot for fun with, no expectations and stuff like that. Street photography is probably high up on my list. Interesting. Do you still do it now? No, I mean, rarely. Northwest Arkansas isn't really like the place to go do street photography either. Like you go to a downtown square and there's maybe 10 people walking around. So I'm very much, um, I'm not into like landscape photography. So like if I'm shooting, I want there to be people in it, even if like they don't know that I'm taking their photo and stuff like that. And so I'm not going to go on a hike and go take pictures of waterfalls and cliffs and stuff. So I like people to be in it. And so street photography is, that's why I lean towards street photography. But in our area, there's not a ton of people out and about like causing a ruckus or doing interesting things. They're just kind of like walking from store to store. So not really the place for street photography. I'll still go out every once in a while and do it. But if I'm going to do it, I'll schedule it around like a trip or something like that. Yeah. You know, Miles painted a picture of Arkansas that's different from, I guess whenever I hear of Arkansas, I always think of like fields and, you know, small towns and, but Miles said there's, he's in a really big town. Yeah. It, and it's gotten bigger and bigger. And so recently, um, in the last few years, um, it's basically become, it's been rated in big publications as like the number one place to move, um, in the United States. Why? Why? Just because Why? our, not, 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 not to sound judgmental. <laughs> well, so our cost of living is still pretty low considering the uh-huh. size of the city and stuff like that. And then we're, um, the headquarters for like Walmart, Tyson food, JB hunt, and a bunch of big companies are in the area and Walmart is just constantly pumping money into the area. Um, oh, so they've created like huge museums and it's actually one of the number one destination locations for mountain biking now. Um, they add like more than a hundred miles of mountain bike trail every wow. year here. 
Yeah. That's crazy. Um, and so, and we're not like, like if you think Arkansas was like flat grass hills, like we're in part of the Ozarks. So we have um, one of the best, most beautiful lakes you could ever go to within 45 minutes of us. Um, there's huge rolling hills, mountain biking, camping, all that fun stuff. And then we also have kind of like that city element um, that's kind of based around all of the Walmart stuff. Like we have a top golf that just opened up. And so we have some of the, like the big city type stuff with the small town feel. So I like it. Interesting. Now, now I got to like make a trip out there. Come on over. I got Wait. a I got a room for you. Bring the okay. kids. We'll go out on the boat. Do you have room for a family of six? We'll get a place. We'll get an Airbnb close to you. Yeah, we can, we can make it happen. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, that sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> one person's one thing, but six people. Um, no, I, wait. So, do you watch? Uh, I asked Miles this too. Do you watch the Ozarks? Um, so I've seen the show. Yeah, I think I'm caught up. I can't remember, but yeah, I've watched it. Did you like it? Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. Most of that is like in the Missouri Ozarks. There's another um, lake that's nearby that's called, I think, Table Rock. Um, and I think uh -huh. that's where the majority of the filming, but they did do some of the filming on like Beaver Lake and in, in our area. Interesting. We were having a conversation about these darker kind of television shows and movies. And like the, are you a fan of like kind of the more dark type uh, shows yeah. and stuff? When I get to watch it, when I'm not watching like Blippi or... Paw Patrol. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is, yes. The amount of adult television time in our household is very minimal. Yeah. So I, I know your pain. You have two or three. You have two, right? Two, two yeah. One's uh, just turned three in October and one's getting ready to turn a year. That's crazy. She's, that, she's, that, she's right at, uh, I think she's right at, right at 10 months right now. That keeps you guys super busy. One of the things that I love about your work is how much you are actually photographing your your family. Can we actually pull up some of Jason's uh, work while we're chatting about it? I, I want them to see. But you, uh, I love the images that you capture of your kids and and of the family, and they're always kind of like wild in the moment. This isn't that that image specifically, but uh, uh, where, gonna where do we it. see? You're gonna, to, um, you're gonna have to go to go back to. Um, and then just do on vincentimage.com, do a backslash family. I don't have a, a way to get there from the wedding side. I'm still kind of messing with this website. I love this stuff. These are, these are your kids, right? Um, so the majority of it right now is, um, is our kids, uh, mixed with some other, uh, family documentary sessions that I've done, but. I love these images, uh, walking down the stairs. That's so cool. Man, I your your style of of photography is uh, absolutely fantastic. The, your usage of of light and shadows and and kind of the the color and play in the images is is incredible. I, I wanted to kind of start with um, since we're looking at these images, where did this kind of style evolve from? Like, what got you here? Um, so I've actually written a couple articles about this, and it's kind of a combination of multiple photographers that I enjoy their style kind of melded together. Uh -huh. um, so I'm a big believer whenever you're starting off in photography to kind of find what you enjoy and learn how to recreate it. And then as you recreate other people's work, um, you find certain elements that you like in, of photographer A and photographer B, and you try and find a way to meld them together. And so it's kind of a way to build your own style based off of um, other people's work. And so it's kind of like a fast track to finding what you like to shoot. Uh, so it's kind of a combination. A lot of it is inspired through like the fearless community. So kind of like that documentary feel with, uh, I love the bold colors, um, but like minimal can I, composition. Can I guess? And stuff like that. Yeah. Can I guess who you're like it, this, it feels almost like a little bit of two man with a little bit of Sam Hurd. Um, am I on track? Yeah, yeah, mixed with like um, some uh, fair Wadisti or however, however you say yeah. his last name, Wadisti. Yeah. Um, I love kind of like like his minimal compositions and stuff like that as well. Um, and then, you know, some of the documentary work like um, Kirsten Lewis and there's a lot of like newspaper documentary photographers um, that I follow that I'm inspired by. And I don't even like follow them on Instagram, so I don't even know their name. I just kind of know their profile picture, but um, inspired by a lot of that work as well. I love this. Go check out, uh, go hop onto his, his wedding work now, Anthony. Uh, it's such an interesting way to, because 
I, I love that approach because the images have distinctly become your own. Like in terms of style, when I see, I can very much separate out your images versus any of these other artists. And it's a very interesting approach to kind of like take and combine until you have crafted your own unique look. Absolutely. That is it's incredible. I, I love the fact that you're not afraid of shadows as well. Like in a lot of your images, I see a lot of deep, dark shadows. Makes yeah. it very unique. Turn it to black, man. <laughs> oh, this is gorgeous. So when did you, when did you start out in wedding photography? Um, 2010. So uh, me and my wife got married in 2010 and we got a nice camera, like a, basically it was an entry level Sony crop sensor DSLR with a kit uh -huh. lens that we took on our honeymoon. And whenever we got back, we posted our honeymoon pictures and one of her friends liked the images and was like, Oh, well, you shoot our family photos. And so we're like, yeah, that could be fun. So we went and met at like a target parking lot and used this like brick wall at a target parking lot, um, taking pictures. And it just kind of turned from that into more and more and more. And it was funny when we first started, we just had one camera, a kit lens, and then I think like a nifty 50 and I would take pictures and then I would give Chasney the camera and she would take turn taking pictures and then she'd give me the camera. So we just like share a camera and That's shoot, so shoot a session together. Yeah. And has Chasney always worked with you in the business? Yep. Yeah. Since day one, we've kind of been a husband and wife team. Um, and then uh, as of recently, she started to take a small step back, not very big, uh, just with kids and stuff. It's hard to do some of like the destination weddings or do like the double headers because she um, she also works a day job with her brother and sister. Uh, and so it's hard for her to work all week and then work all weekend. Crazy. So at, at what point did you feel like, so you you guys start kind of switching off the camera and you got in it, which by the way, every one of us starting out, I feel like if we're truthful, we all thought that we had a professional setup uh, and really I had a rebel. I had a rebel from, <laughs> from Costco. That was my pro camera. Um, but you start out switching off. And at what point do people start saying, we'll pay you to come and shoot? Um, I think it was just like, as, as we started diving into the industry and educating ourselves, we kind of started to realize that us shooting for free or, or for as cheap as we were was kind of a disservice for other photographers in the area. And so we started charging money. And so we decided, you know, you know, we're charging money now, so we can't just be like passing off the camera. So then we went in and we bought, um, our first like actual professional kit was still in the Sony ecosystem as the original, I think it's the first full frame Sony camera that they ever produced. It was the Sony a 900. Uh, so we went and bought two of those. And so then we actually had two full frame cameras and then we got like a 24 to 70, 70 to 200. And then we had the kit lens, but it's funny. So still on wedding days, we just had the 24 to 70 and the 70 to 200. So if I had the 70 to 200, she had the 24 to 70. If I wanted that, we just had to switch back and forth. And so like one of us was that's always funny. wide. One of us was always tight, which works out. Cause that's kind of generally what you want out of a, out of a two shooter team yeah. um, until it got to the dance floor. Then we kind of had to like battle over the 24 to 70 because <laughs> no one wants to shoot receptions with a 70 to 200. <laughs> yeah. Trying to, to imagine uh, like telephoto lenses, you're, you're shooting something that's 30, 40 feet away and on a dance floor, you can't get 30 to 40 feet away. There's no distance <laughs> like between no. like, so there's no way to, to, to shoot that effectively. Otherwise you're just shooting like the entire group of people just dancing. But yeah. But that's so interesting. So was it was it genuinely the fact that you felt like you were doing a disservice to the industry that you guys started charging money or was it the, the well, need no, to start creating wanted, income? Yeah, we wanted to start creating income. And I mean, at this point, I was a full time mechanical engineer for Tyson Foods. And so it was not necessarily that we needed to make the money. But if we were going to spend that much time in in this field and use and be start start doing stuff like after hours and like come home from work and work some more, like it needed to be worth our time as well. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I always, I kind of have issue with the statement of like giving away or shooting for free hurts the industry. Namely because like, I feel like the type of clients that want free work are not the type of clients that want, you know, paid work. Like I don't, I don't think those are the, the, the same Absolutely. thing, you know, when a client comes the client that's looking to spend five to $10,000 for their work has, 
wants a certain thing and they want reliability, consistency, brand recognition. They want all those different things. They never once would think to like that I, I could not pay for this. So it, it never felt like to me that it was the same group of people. So I never got that statement. I don't know if you felt the same way, but I, th- I think, yeah, that's accurate at the level that we're at now. But at kind of like that beginner level, you know, you're charging maybe 200 bucks for a session. Then you're kind of in that realm where someone it might be willing to pay $200 or they'll take it for free if they can get it kind of thing. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I noticed, too, which is why everybody should be charging something for whatever it is that you offer, is that nobody appreciates free crap. I mean, like, it doesn't even matter how good it is. If it's for free, you just don't value it. Right. I saw uh, a meme the other day where it's like, uh, it's like you, client, you a, a, a meme, a meme, a meme, whatever <laughs> meme. <laughs> that's, a, that's a new one. Like, how do you say GIF? GIF. I, I would, I, I would agree with that. Wouldn't you agree with that, Anthony? I say GIF. But you say GIF? Yeah. I feel like it should be a GIF. It's a gift. Why isn't it a GIF? I think the creator of the GIF has actually come out and said how it's supposed to be pronounced. Which is a GIF, and he shouldn't have used a G. You, you use a J <laughs> in that case. Is it, is it, is it supposed to be a GIF? GIF, GIF? He, he came out and said it's and pronounced forth. GIF. GIF? Okay. But, yeah, he used a, a G, so it's GIF. Yeah, he should have, he should have used a J, but... Okay, oh, so it's, anyway... Uh, sorry, it's official got... by Time Magazine. It says GIF, not GIF. Yeah, whatever. We're going to call it a GIF. <laughs> he chose a G. So what did you notice? You you noticed what? Oh, no. I saw, I saw it was, um, and it was like $500 client. And it's like, these are the most important images of our lives. We want you to take them seriously, blah, blah, blah. And it was like this huge paragraph explaining that it was like $5,000 clients, like money sent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For sure, dude. It's, it's kind of wild. And bro, we have a, a ritual of lighting the candle before each of these. And I totally forgot to light your candle. So let me light your <laughs> candle now. Um, but it's very interesting the way that that works. And I, I find it carrying over to almost every aspect of life. How many people, I, I can name a number of people, uh, close friends that have made money off of like Bitcoin or whatever recent thing. Like it's basically free money, right? They don't even value the free money. They get it and they're like, oh, I've always been wanting this $10,000 guitar. I'm just going to go buy it now. And like it just becomes <laughs> another thing. And the money that comes in that that was not earned with any difficulty, it goes out without any difficulty. Like it's so, and I find that with anything. Like you could, someone could come to you and be like, Unless it's something sentimental, you know, if it's a genuine gift and sentimental, then that's one thing. But I can come to you and be like, dude, uh, how many trade shows do you go to? And you get these like nice free little like $50 to $100 items and you don't even like care about them. I don't even know where they are. They just a lot of the times they're just like, well, I've never actually spend my money on that. And it's not even something that I need or want. So I'm just taking it because it's free. Yeah. And when, when it's a client, when it's a person that comes to you and, and, and when we're talking like photography or any creative service, the ones that pay the least are genuinely the most demanding people. Generally, the, the, they have the most needs, the most wants, the most everything. Mm-hmm. And, they're, they're, and they want to hop on a phone call for an hour and a half and talk about it every other week. And <laughs> so to me, it's like... If you're not charging, you're really doing yourself a disservice. Um, I, I don't see it in the way of like you're hurting the industry. I'm like you're you're really just hurting yourself. I don't know. Well, yeah, you're you're doing both for sure. <laughs> but so tell me, you so you you go into well, actually, what even made you want to focus in on wedding photography specifically? Um, our first wedding. So someone finally was like, Hey, we want you to shoot our wedding. We're like, Oh, I don't know about that. We've never done one before. Just as long as you're sure. I think we charged him like 500 bucks and we went in and at the very end of the day, it was just like a huge day of chaos, not really fully knowing what we're doing and just kind of rolling with the punches. But we both sat in the car and we're like, that was a lot of fun. Like, let's keep doing that. Um, and so that's kind of like how we niche down into this like wedding engagement type genre interesting 
So it went from basically doing these these photo shoots with friends, family, and then mm -hmm. some someone led to wedding. Like here's yep. you know, do you want to shoot at a wedding? I I don't recall my first experience going that well. I, I remember walking away from like the very first time that I actually was at a wedding and, and going like, I don't think I want to do this. But then <laughs> there was this weird like miss like like i after a couple of days i was like man i miss that feeling of of capturing and documenting and creating and it kind of came this uh you know this enjoyment of it a little bit over over a, i don't want to say it it was like over years it was like my first three to six shoots were kind of like i'm not sure if this is for me mm -hmm. but that's interesting to both sit in the car and be like that was really exciting that was really fun and both of yeah. you were working full-time jobs at that time yep Crazy. Yeah, um, up until I was still full time until four years ago. Oh, I, didn't I think know around that. four years ago. Yeah. So, um, have you seen my um, holy festival images? Yeah, those are amazing. So that that was um, that was the Can reason we why pull I pulled those up, Anthony. Wait, you that was the reason you quit? Yeah. So, um, working for F Stoppers. Um, uh -huh. I got the opportunity to go to India to write an article about a company called Pro Image Editors, I believe. They're a post-production company based out of India. Um, and they were going to fly me up to do this like interview with a bunch of people that work there and take pictures of like behind the scenes and see how it all worked. And um, they're going to do a couple like sponsored posts through F-Stoppers. And then as part of that, um, because they're flying us down, they were going to um, let me stay an extra week and go to the Holy Festival. And so at this point, um, we're already shooting destination weddings and um, traveling all over, the, all over the country. And so I'm using literally every single day of vacation for these weddings. Um, obvi wow. And obviously, we're, we're tacking on a day or two here or there for like little vacations as we're, as we're out of town. Um, but I had no more vacation days. And so I went to my boss and I put in the application for two weeks off without pay so that I could go on this trip. And they told me no. And so I put in my two weeks right. Um, I put in my two weeks notice two weeks before this flight. That's wild. That's wild that you got this opportunity from writing for F stoppers. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Th this is the, one of the crazy aspects is I don't know that a lot of photographers understand. Um, and really this could apply to any area, but the, power and the amount of connections that are created by simply getting involved with a platform and writing like this is it, it, I, I've seen F stoppers launch so many careers uh, and likewise on the SR lounge side we have helped so many photographers get connected and get the jobs that they're like actually seeking when in reality all they're doing is writing a piece of education all they're doing is like mm -hmm. writing an article on something and it's crazy the kind of doors that it opens up yeah. That's so yeah. Cool. And even to this day, my high school English teachers would probably gasp if they found out that I was getting paid to write. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, I'm still waiting for the day where someone figures it out and is like, Oh, you can't do this anymore. <laughs> Wait, but that's the funny thing though. Cause I I've read your articles and they're fantastic and they're written from just a colloquial, like it's, it's Jason speaking to me like you would right now. Like it's not, it's not like some like formal, article if that makes sense yeah no one wants to read that or in general people but don't that's what we're, generally we're like taught that, though yeah. We're, yeah. we're taught that in school like growing up like i was never i was never taught the voice that i currently use to write everything that i write you know what i mean like i i, I write the what i write the way that i that i speak but like you said if you go and you show that to your teacher they'll be like are you kidding this is this is horrible writing this is not but that's what people want and that's what they buy. And this is kind of one of the big reasons that I have such an issue with like traditional schooling is because generally the theory of what works in business and creativity and art and, you know, all these, the theory of that is what's taught and the practical reality is so much different. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you had that experience. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I can't really recall ever using something that I learned in school. I mean, even as a mechanical <laughs> engineer, like, like I went, I got my degree in mechanical engineering and my job 
wasn't actually mechanical engineering based. It was just hired because I had a technical degree. And so literally everything that I learned in school was thrown out the window. The instant I took this job, it was just kind of like learn all of their processes and their programs and, and then move forward. And so it was just like, I don't know. It, it seemed kind of pointless. <laughs> it is a very strange thing. Cause that's, you're, you're not a stranger in that. Most people would say the exact same thing. I, I would say the exact same thing. I was in I, I had a class called Earthquakes and Volcanoes for crying out loud, dude. I'm in I'm in college with a class called Earthquakes and Volcanoes, and I still have yet to utilize any of that information. But what does a, a mechanical engineer for Tyson? You said Tyson Foods, right? Yeah. What, what does that look like? What are you doing from day to day? Well, so they they do have mechanical engineers that help des- like design stuff and do like um like actual mechanical engineering work. Um, but my job was actually on the software side and I helped design and test programs that manage like quality control and like product tracking and stuff like that. Um, so if for, for example, like say a bag of salt gets recalled by a manufacturer and they use Uh that bag of salt in however many products that go down the line, you have to be able to trace every single product that that bag of salt touched. Oh, and so wild. there's different processes and procedures that go into place and like programs that track that. And so you could literally put in that bag of salt in this program and it'll tell you every single distribution center that it went to, every supplier that might have gotten it. And you can recall all of that back into the facility. And it, and it works like that for everything, including like chicken and beef and steaks and all that stuff. But that's software engineering, is it not? Um. Kind of, but I wasn't actually on the side that was building the program. So I would say I was on the team that would like say, this is what the program needs to do. A okay. software engineer or someone would design it and then it would come back and then we would test it and make sure that it did what it did. And then we'd also go to the plants and teach them how to use it. Interesting. And what did you enjoy that job? I'm, I'm very curious. Like, how do you. Uh, yeah. How did you feel at that job? Was it something that you liked? Um, I liked it starting out. Um, I didn't really love that I was doing something that I didn't go to school for because what I went to school for, I actually enjoyed. And that's kind of what I wanted to do initially. Um, but when I first got hired, I was part of the team that specifically went to the plants to teach them how to use it. Uh, so I traveled my first year with Tyson foods. I traveled 48 weeks out of 52. I was on the road. Oh, wow. And so I was, I've traveled all over the country and we'd go to like We'd, we'd go to like Chicago and spend like 15 weeks there, but I'd fly back and forth on the weekends to come back and basically hang out in my apartment and go with friends and then fly back out. Um, so that was fun until I got married and then it kind of started to not be so fun. And so then I got yeah. a, like I, I got put on as part of a team that was at the corporate office. And then at that point, that's when I was part of the team that was like, this is what the programs need to do. And then I would test it and make sure that it worked. And we did a couple of other little things. But it was very much just sitting behind a computer at a cubicle and um i found that miserable that sounds so completely different from who you are and what you are right now right do you do you feel like um do you feel like at that time let's say what it is that you valued I'm, i'm very curious if you were just kind of like in the wrong position, like you were at the wrong job and, and those things didn't align with who you are. Do you feel like who you are kind of evolved and changed and you, and you became a photographer from that? Um, I think I probably just kind of, I don't know if I necessarily evolved, but I think it just took me a while to figure out what it is that I wanted to do. And then even after I became a photographer and I was doing so, so many weddings a year and still working full time, I still wasn't, like it still took a, a decent mental shift for me to be like, this is okay for me to do full time. Because in the back of my head, I was just like, I went to college, I have to use my college degree kind mm-hmm. of thing. And so it took a long time for me to be okay with essentially throwing that out the window. And I, I say throw it out the window just because I'm not using it. But in essence, it got me to where I am. So yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't change the fact that I went to school for that. And I went through all of these steps to get where I am because otherwise I might not be a photographer if I went down a different road. Um, so yeah, you also, I think I I just kind of figured it out. Yeah. It seems like, cause you are a very, very technical person. Like when I, when I look at your imagery, I see a a really nice mixture between creativity and, and technicality. Um, 
it almost feels like yeah over time that you kind of found this career this this niche that allowed you to tap into both sides that ba- better fit kind of who you are and the values that you have um to this point where it's very authentic like when i look at your images they're they feel very authentically you yeah i and i think that's why photography has been something that i've enjoyed or something that i was able to like keep going down the path of being a photographer because i very much like the creative aspect and I like the problem solving, but then I, it is very much a technical art. And so Mm -hmm. I still have this like ability to deep dive into the geeky stuff of cameras and read and read about like sync speeds and all that fun stuff and like image processor outputs. And so like you can, and you don't need that stuff, but it's still something that, um, I find satisfaction in. Yeah. So I can, I can have both sides of that. Well, and now you're you're teaching. Can we actually pull up Jason's? Uh, you have uh, what is it called? A Patreon. Uh, Patreon. Right? Patreon. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have to pull that up because now you're doing tutorials on Patreon, which are awesome. Um, so if anyone listening is interested in learning more about photography, they can learn directly from you through Patreon. But you've also done a lot of in-person uh, education. Yes. Yeah. So I've taught at a handful of. Um, like workshops like WPPI and some other smaller workshops and uh, led photo walks and stuff. And it's something that I want to do more of. It's just kind of, I, I need to sit down and like line out like a lesson plan and do all that stuff. Like the, like one of my favorite parts about teaching is like the photo walks at WPPI. Cause I literally just show up. I have no plan at all. And it's just like, take a group of 12, 20, 30 people and just go walk around and be like, this is, this is what I'm seeing. This is why I'm here. And just walking through my process and have no plan because that's how i show up to a shoot also like i'm very big on not having a plan as i show up to a shoot in general that's so interesting now, tell me i, I want to hear more about that in general because that wouldn't necessarily be the advice that i would give so i, w- <laughs> I want to hear like from your perspective <laughs> what does that mean and I don't you... like, yeah go ahead no, no no i'm just curious when you show up to a wedding how much uh-huh. of a plan is a plan and how much do you let you know, free flow. Um, 99% is just free flow. Like I have the, Explain I have the more. timeline. I have that. <laughs> okay. So I have, you have so the timeline. on a wedding. So on the wedding day, I have a timeline. So I know when certain things are happening and outside of that, I have no plan. Like I don't have, I don't, I don't walk around and be like, okay, come portrait time. I'm going to do a shoot. I'm going to shoot this and then I'm going to go over here and I'm going to do this. Like I'd have no plan. Like when portrait time starts, I know where I'm going to start. And then it's just, I see what I see and I do what I'm going to do. So do you, you don't scout like a location just to know what it has or anything like that? In general, no. Like, um, I might like drive around and just kind of see where some opportunities are. And so mm-hmm. I have a general idea of like, as if we leave a venue and we're going to walk a little bit, I know which direction to walk, but I don't, I don't leave, like, I don't say, oh, I want to shoot against that wall. Sometimes I'll see something as I'm scouting be like, oh, I could definitely make that work and we're going to walk that way. But I try and have the idea to the hardest part for me is having an idea and it not being able to work. So that's the reason, the reason why I went down this road of like not scouting is because I would show up to a shoot and we'd walk, we'd show up early and walk around be like, Oh, I want to shoot right there. And then by the time it came to shooting portraits, the light was different. Something was in the mm-hmm. way, but I would still try and make it work. So I have a hard time letting an idea go. And so I it's see. much easier for me to get an idea in the moment when I know I can make it work. And if I can't make it work, then I don't even, it's not even an option. That's also the same reason why, um, I shoot with such a minimal gear kit. Um, I shot five years and literally the only two lenses I owned was 35 and 85 Interesting. because I don't have, I don't have to decide what lens I'm going to use. I don't have to be like, mm-hmm. Oh, 24, 16, 35, 85, 135, 70 to 200. It's just like, if I need to be wide, it's 35. I need to be close 85. No mental capacity needs to be thinking about what lens I'm going to use. It almost sounds like you're trying to find ways to kind of mitigate, you know, decision paralysis kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting. When, when I when I approach any shoot, um, I like to I like to scout with um, Sunseeker. So I'll just have a little app where I can basically just see where the sun's going to move throughout the day. Mm-hmm. So I have an idea of like you know where the sun's going to be in relation to each spot. But I like to know each spot. Um, and then when it comes time to shoot. 
I don't have no problem like not using any of the things that I scouted, but usually usually I'll I'll know, okay, at this time of day, this is probably the best spot. So we're gonna walk towards that direction or, you know, things like that. And if I don't do that, I find myself getting incredibly stressed. So like I have mm. I'll feel like a real sense of anxiety because I, I, I don't know if, you know, a certain spot, maybe there's going to be, maybe that spot is shut down, you know, maybe that there's not available, maybe it's this. And, and, uh, it's just interesting the, the different approaches to it on, on your side, yeah. it's like, you know, you're preventing that decision paralysis issue on my side. It's like, I need to have all the options available. Otherwise I feel like that same side of paralysis. Yeah. Well, do you, do you shoot with two photographers all the time? Um, not all the time. So, well, for our clients generally, yes, but like we've like, I'll, I've done quite a few destination shoots alone. Um, mm -hmm. and most of our, like most of my portrait sessions that I do for education, for, you know, content, those things are just by myself with, you know, our behind the scenes crew, like Anthony will come along or Mike will come along and film behind the mm -hmm. scenes. But the majority of time that I spend shooting, I'm shooting alone. Gotcha. So the reason why I think it works out is because I, we always have a second photographer, like all of our packages come with two photographers. It's not something that we feel a client should have to, to add on. Yeah. Um, and so whenever it comes to portrait time, um, we, I, we take turns. So I'll have an idea and I'll shoot that idea. And, uh, my wife Chasney, or if we, ha if I have another second photographer is more than welcome to shoot while I shoot my idea, but then next is going to be their turn. And then when it's their turn, now I have five, 10 minutes that I can kind of look around and get my next, get my bearings and figure out what I want to do next. Gotcha. Um, and then when it comes to shooting by myself, I just have come to the conclusion that, you know, most of the time I'm shooting couples and so they're fine with hanging out with each other. And so I have no problem being like, just hang out with each other for five minutes while I look around and see what I want to do next. Mm. Yeah. If And so I don't, and so that, that relieves that anxiety of like, like you don't have to be shooting 100% of the time. Like it's okay to take a break for five minutes and look around. Like they, they don't mind hanging out with each other. <laughs> for sure. No, on, on portrait sessions, I generally am going quite a bit slower. Sometimes on weddings though, you don't even have, you barely have five minutes to get like, some of our timelines are pretty crazy, man. I mean, I, I feel like the higher our, our, in general, the higher a client's contract becomes, the less time and freedom I feel like is allowed in, in that space. Mm -hmm. There was a, there was kind of like this sweet spot of, and I feel like there's the same thing in, in probably any type of creative endeavor, but there was this sweet spot between like the four and $6,000 range where like you'd get clients that are paying a good amount of money. They, they very much have a respect of the craft and the artwork and they're they want to give you a lot of time they like, they, they enjoy it. They want to give you the time. And then I noticed once we started getting beyond that and the packages were 10, 20 plus, they're almost hiring the brand. Like it's like they, they want the brand recognition component of like, ha you know, having us there and the rest is, it's just a party and you capture what you can capture. Like, we're not going to give you that much time if you want, Mm -hmm. 10 minutes after the ceremony, we'll get you 10. Like, despite how much education goes into it, there, there mm -hmm. are the one-offs, you know, but this is in general, like the, the more that's being spent, there's so many moving pieces on these million dollar weddings that I don't have the luxury to be like, I need 30 minutes, you know, for something like I'll say it, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And I, that's generally how our weddings are too. So we don't have, we don't generally have a lot of time for portraits and the, the majority of the work we do is strictly documentary. Yeah. And so that, that helps too. Like I don't do a lot of scouting cause we don't do a lot of, we do portraits, but we don't spend a ton of time on portraits. I see. So your, your clients are coming specifically because that documentary aspect and you're there with them capturing whatever it is that they're doing. So the need to necessarily like go off and go do something else isn't there. Yeah. And then the, other than that, like we, we have, we, I call it portrait breakout sessions just for lack of a better term, just so clients are aware, like if I see and I'm inspired by something, I'll just pull them to the side and take a quick portrait and then let them get back to what they're doing. So we don't necessarily need portrait time. And then that gives me the ability to be inspired on the spot and then just grab them real quick, take a, take a portrait for five minutes, let them get back to what they're doing. And, that, and that's how I get the majority of like these creative images. Cause I'm inspired on the spot by something. Yeah. So it, it must be 
I mean, I, I would think it's nice and there's probably also drawbacks to this. I'm going to let you speak on it, but, um, it must be nice working with Chasney on this side in terms of when you guys are creating your, your artwork, you have another stakeholder present, you know, you have another owner in the business that's, that's directly affected by the, the Vincent images name. Sometimes I feel like, uh, well, in, in many cases, you know, having a, an associate program or like second shooters or third shooters that are outside of your company, they're not necessarily intrinsically attached to the product that they're creating, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if, if it doesn't necessarily go that smoothly, if they don't deliver, let's say they deliver 70% of their usual, you know, delivery mm-hmm. as a second or as a third shooter, that's okay because they get to walk away at the end of the day. They have their, their paycheck and, and you get to handle the rest of the business side. Yeah. So from that side, I'm sure you can rest a little bit easier given that Chasney's next to you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in general, it's a very good thing. Uh, starting out, obviously, you're going to get your um, your bumps and turns running into each other, or trying to figure out who does what with the business. And once you kind of figure, once we were able to figure out, like, oh, you know what? I do the calling and editing. You kind of handle the finance side of it. And like, we had kind of our own boxes that we stayed in that kind of helped things flow a little bit better. But I mean, even today, Chasney will tell you I'm constantly getting in her way. Like it's, it's the, it's, uh, I won't like, I try and keep my bearings and see where she's at. But if I see something, I'm darting in to get it. And then by the time I'm done, I'll turn around and just be like, I was, I was already standing here. (laughs) It's like, sorry, I didn't even see you. I just saw something and I dove in and that, and that comes with the documentary aspect because we don't, we're not going to have them do something over again. Like if I see it, it has to be, it has to be shot in the moment. So in general, can you, can you walk me through like, what has it been like being in business? Cause you're in business with your wife. Um, you are also, you know, at home, you are lovers. You're also parents. You're also, you know, friends, like you've mixed every single world together. What is that like? Um, awesome. I mean, it's, it's great. We get to spend a lot of time, a lot more time together, especially like destination weddings instead of me traveling out by myself or having to bring a buddy that can the second shoot with me. Like we get to make a little family vacation about it. Um, when we first had our son before he was one, he went on 19 different flights. And so we went on a, just a whole bunch that's of little insane. mini family vacations. Um, and that's not something like if we weren't business partners and shooting together, that would just be a very big added expense to have another flight every single time you go on a wedding. But now it's yeah. just kind of built into what we're already doing and we just pay an extra two, three days of hotel room and our son flies free to at least two. And so we just kind of just make little mini vacations and it's amazing. Yeah. Well, see, this is where I know you have a good relationship because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not always, it's not always bells and whistles. I mean, but also traveling with your wife just in general can be hectic. So like, <laughs> Well, you know, if, if the two of you, let's say had kind of values that were misaligned in in certain ways, like if the two of you like didn't necessarily align in the way that you see and, and and your life philosophies and, you know, your, your beliefs, and I'm not talking about like spiritual, I'm talking about like the, the way that you, like you sound like a very experiential person. Um, and it makes sense, right? Like Mm -hmm. you're, you're about, I I would think that you would be about experiences more than about, you know, any material thing. Um, and it sounds like these trips give you these opportunities to, to spend time with family. But if, if she were not similarly aligned, then, Oh yeah. All then the would time just together totally would be all apart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause you, you essentially like, I, I, one of the funny things, the, the recent book that I've written is on relationships. And one of the funny pieces of advice that is given out when people are struggling is to spend more quality time together. Like you just need quality time. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> well, you know, if things aren't working out, then like, adding quality time to the equation is like, you know, pouring gasoline onto a fire. Like you need to first, like, let's, let's figure out what's causing the fire before you like go and pour gas onto it. Um, but in your case where like everything is, is largely, um, you know, working well, then I can see the, the beauty in it. I mean, being able to go with your partner to these weddings, being able to document them, I, I would imagine there's an emotional high that comes with that as well. 
just walking mm-hmm. away at the end of the day. Yeah. And then on top of that, you guys get to go and have your travel experiences. So what is some of the funnest, uh, funnest, the, the best trips that you guys have been on recently? Um, let's see recently. The, the most, the best, I mean, the best trips recently were just like family vacations. We went to Hawaii and the Bahamas and, and stuff like that. One, one of our funnest trips or most fun trips, uh, for a wedding was we shot a wedding in Belize and oh, the right. couple, um, the couple, uh, the, uh, the wife had lived in Belize for a year, um, as part of like her schooling and stuff like that. And so when we went down, we actually spent, um, an entire week there. And for the first week before the wedding, we traveled, um, like as a local type crew through, through Belize, staying in like these little small towns and like traveling with all the locals on what they call the chicken bus. And it's essentially a school bus that's been fitted into this travel bus to take you from little town to town. And they call it a chicken bus because they'll pick up little farmers that are picking up chickens. And so they have, they're holding their chickens. And, That's hilarious. um, so yeah. And so we did all that and then we end up on, we end up on, a uh, spent two or three nights on this little Island, uh, that has no vehicles. You can just go travel by, um, golf cart and stuff like that. And then at the very end of the trip, they got married in this, um, this big like mansion that they had rented out on the side of the ocean. Yeah. That sounds incredible. And have you done these types of trips with both kids yet or or when you were doing these you just had one at the time uh no so that one was before we had kids um okay we the other ones were just kind of like local stuff we did um our first destination wedding that we did with our son was um to tulum mexico and it was i think he was two months old three months old Mm -hmm. um and at that point so we spent a week in tulum and we actually brought her, uh, my wife's parents down, um, oh, to watch cool. Zayden like on the wedding and stuff like that. So, so, cause we didn't want to like hire some random resort person to watch our three month old. So made yeah, a little like family idea. vacation out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Very smart <laughs> yeah. idea. Yeah. In general, we, we try and have like either bring a babysitter or have someone that we know, or like a very close, like a very close friend of a friend or something like that, that we, that we can have watch, watch him as we're gone. Um, like we did that in, uh, we did a wedding in Detroit with Zayden and, um, he stayed at like a old friend that used to actually live in the area that we, they stayed with his babysitter at the time. And so I see. So you said that Chasney's still working full time right now. Yeah. Wow. So, so how are you guys balancing? I mean, your business granted 2020 was a little bit of a slower year. Um, mm-hmm. but in general still you're managing uh, a business together, which she handles the finance side of that, right? Mm-hmm. She, you guys are also parents of two and she's working full time. How, how does this happen? Um, I mean, so like a regular day is we wake up, she leaves around eight ish to go to work. Um, and then we have a sitter that comes and watches the kids from, um, nine to three. And so nine to three is when I get all of my okay. work done. And then after okay. that, I take over the kids and then, um, work as needed outside of that, where one of us can watch or both of us can watch. Yeah. What I, I wanted to ask you about this because some people, uh, there's this weird, um, I guess everybody has kind of like these different understandings of productivity and effectiveness and uh, one of the conversations that I got into with Miles is a little bit of how people don't understand the difference between efficiency versus effectiveness. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a lot of conversations around those subjects that focus purely on efficiency versus like effectiveness of, of work. But one of the things that I love about having shorter windows to get your work done is that you choose the things that matter most and you get them done. Like your, I would imagine that nine to three time period, you are incredibly effective. I skip a lot of lunches. <laughs> it's just, and not not on purpose. I'll just like you get you get in the zone and you just start working, and all of a sudden you're like the the sitter's knocking on the door, and it's like it's time for me to leave. It's like oh, it's three yeah. o'clock. Okay. <laughs> but there's there's a kind of a beauty to that. I, I don't know if you ever like early on in, in our business, when Justin, Chris and I started, we were very much about hours. Okay. So it was like, 
all of the partners are going to put in at least 12 hours a day. Like we, we had that commitment to each other, right? And when you know that you're going into the office for 12 hours, you work like you have 12 hours. You kind of dick around you you know do this you take little breaks you if i'm going to be here till 8 p.m anyway i'm going to get and over time we we got into kind of a few battles around this subject because some of us were still stuck on the hours thing justin had moved on to effectiveness um, i started realizing that okay effectiveness is is more important but over the years we started to realize that uh you know what 10 hours well placed throughout the week is far more effective than 40 hours of screwing around. Yeah. And you'll be much happier. <laughs> and you'll be much and you'll happier. Still get the same work, and you'll still get the same work done. Yeah, that, that, that was the wild part to me was like anytime. So at this point, you know, anytime I feel like I just don't want to work anymore today, I just leave. Mm-hmm. Like if, if I have had enough I used to sit there and if, if it was 2 p.m. and I was like, oh man, I'm done. I feel like I, I shouldn't be here anymore. I would still stay till 6 or 7. And and part of this had to do with like my, my home life and marriage was was a disaster. I didn't necessarily want to go back home. But <laughs> but the other side of it too was just like I need to get my hours in. You know, like, mm-hmm. And I it took a long time to realize that that was not effective. That if I left it 2 and just got my mind completely onto something else and enjoyed my time and then came back fresh the next day, I could accomplish the exact same thing in less time. Yeah. So did, did you find that that was something that you had previously or did you find that that came with your kids? Like, um, I think I've always kind of had that, that mindset and that, that I think that was one of the hardest parts about working like that cubicle life. Mm-hmm. Because you very much have the like, you need to be here from eight to five mentality. It is, it is, and the and it was. It's you. I'd sit around for three hours because I'm waiting on someone else, and I have nothing else to do. Why am I here? It's like exactly I could, e- I could easily go home and get all of this other stuff done that I need to do, and so it just made me like despise the job even more because I'm sitting around wasting. I'm wasting my time because I don't have anything to do, and but I still have the expectation that I need to be here. Yeah. So, so whenever I, whenever I got out of the job, like I very much had that, like if I have something to do, then I can get it done. And if I, if it takes me 40 hours a week, then that's fine. I need to get it done. But if I don't have like right now, I don't have, I'm all caught up on editing sessions. And so if I don't want to work on my blogging and SEO and all this stuff, like I, like it's not, I don't need to have it done today. And so I can, take a break and I can go do something and go ride my one wheel or I can play a game of chess on my phone or something. <laughs> well, in, in, in our side of corporate America and, in, in accounting, you were, uh, not only was this like nine to five or nine to six, it wasn't even nine. To five, it was like, yeah, it was nine to six was like the expectation, but you were rewarded for nine to nine. So, and it didn't matter if you were more productive. It was just, you know, if the partners saw that you were the last one to leave, then they would speak nicely about you and you'd probably be more likely to get 2% more at the end of the year. I mean, it's such a marginal thing like that, Mm -hmm. but that, and in many cases you wouldn't, in many cases it was just about like, well, you know, if so-and-so is leaving at seven, I'm going to leave at eight. It was just about showing up the, you know, the person that was next to you so you could look better uh, when it came to evaluations or just to, and just in general keeping your job. But there yeah. was no productivity happening in that time. Usually the productivity ceased around 3 p.m. And people just hung out for six hours. Yeah. And I, it, it blew my mind. And if you didn't, they would talk about you behind your back. Like, can you believe that Pi left early? And I didn't leave early. I left like at 6 p.m. You know what I mean? Yeah. You still left like two hours after your eight-hour day or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Like... It, it blew my mind how it was this culture built around this. And, and I find that people that had corporate experience, they very much take that initially into their business mindset. And that's where you have like the, the power of like a book, like four hour work week, Tim Ferriss is it kind of opens your mind. Like I, I do believe that you need to work more than four hours a week, but at least it opens your mind to like the idea of effective mm-hmm. time versus, you know, just trying to be efficient or just trying to put in hours. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you could work a four hour week if you have processes that are automated and you don't have to do certain things. And, but, well, so tell me now what does your work week look like? Like you've, you've got things well established. This is, you know, you have a good well-oiled machine now. What does your work week look like? Um, I work from nine to three every day, except for Fridays. Um, on Fridays, Chasney comes home at, um, around 12 and then I'll take off around 12 and we'll just have like a, like a half day where we both don't work. And then we have our weekends. And, um, if I'm shooting weddings on weekends, then I'll usually take like a half day during the week to kind of rewind and kind of get my bearings back and stuff. But in the day, I just like, I don't have a strict schedule every day. It's just kind of like I have a running list of stuff that I want to get done and I try and prioritize what it is I'm going to spend my time on and what's going to get the most value the soonest out Mm -hmm. of what I'm, what I need to work on. Is there like this, like the last, the last month has been albums. Like I've been just, I think I ordered seven albums this week. Oh, wow. Is there any specific tools that you're using to kind of keep yourself on track with, with those things, like any apps, any specific things that you can't live without? No. And I had a, I had an, I've tried to use apps and I just never opened them. And so I just have like a pad of paper or, um, I've started to use my little tablet where it's just like, it's a basically a digital piece of paper where I'll just write notes and I can like cross it out and and stuff like that. This is what I do too, my friend. I, yeah, I, I don't like productivity apps and, and all. I, I don't have anything negative to say about them per se. I just, I if find you can use them, then they're great. Paper. I just, I found that I'd spend more time trying to set it up. And then mm-hmm. I would never open it or like I'd set it up like, Oh, remind me every day at eight that this is something I need to get done. And the way my schedule is like, I don't have a strict schedule. And so it'll all, I'd always get the reminder when I <laughs> couldn't do it and be, I'd be like, Oh, I'll, I'll remember to get that, get to that. And so it just didn't work. And so it's much easier for me to like come to my desk and like, now I'm ready to work. And I could look down and be like, this is my list of stuff that I have to do, or I'll just leave a tab open on my browser. And whenever I first open up my computer, I'll be like, Oh yeah, that's what I was working on when I left yesterday. I'll go ahead and start. I'll go ahead and finish where I left off. Yeah. The, I think the only productivity app that makes sense to me is Basecamp. Uh, and that's only from a team's perspective. Cause like if you have teams and, and people around you that need to assign you tasks, mm-hmm. then it makes sense, you know, to have everything kind of like go through Basecamp where you can kind of prioritize and whatnot. But for me personally, the sketch pad, like I, I go through about, I want to say like six sketch pads a, a year and they're just, they basically just become like my, my work journals and like my productivity journals of like, what things do I need to get done? What are some of my ideas and things like that? And, um, mm-hmm. I'm kind of excited about, it. I just got a remarkable two tablet. Have you heard about those? Uh, oh, is it like the, it, it acts like paper kind of thing? Yeah. It's a tablet yeah. that is like paper. So it, it's, it's supposed to like feel, taking notes and stuff like that. Exactly. And all it is, is you just, it just has a simple organizational structure. You can, it's basically just like having every sketch pad with you at a time, you know? Yeah. So that's supposed to be here soon. And I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more excited about it. Like there's something about physically writing something down for me that Mm -hmm. is so much different and better than any type of note taking or, or digital medium. Yeah, I agree. Uh, whenever I was going, uh, when I was in college, uh, my first, the first laptop that I bought was actually like one of the first tablets that had like a pen. It was like this Toshiba thing where the screen would yeah. flip around and you could lay down yeah, and you yeah. take notes. I remember those. And I loved it. I literally had every single, and I got it like my first year of college. And so, and I, it lasted me the entire um, time that I was in college. And so every day when I was in school, I had every single note for every single class that I had ever taken. That's rad. And so like learn, like as I, as I learned to use it, like general note taking was a certain color. If it was like an equation that I needed to remember, it'd be a different color if it was like, so I was able to like color code it. So it was super easy for me, like pull up an old note and then scroll through and find what I needed. Whereas like old pieces of paper or something like imagine having to flip through like seven different notebooks, like what class yeah. was that? Like- <laughs> yeah. No, all my, all my notebooks are piling up and it's kind of cool to like, look at them, you know, like, to say I filled up a shelf of notebooks, but at the same time, the, um, the effectiveness of trying to find notes, is like <laughs> you're like, I have no clue which year, which notebook that went into. So yeah. a lot of times like I, I, I'm, I'm really excited for this little, little device, but, um, 
That's super interesting. And I'm, I'm curious now. So going back to the photography side, I'm, 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 I'm curious where you are drawing inspiration from now. Like when you, I would imagine when you are in the height of, of a wedding season and things, you're, you're shooting quite a bit. Uh, so where do you feel like you are drawing your inspiration from? Um, I th- in general, inspired. I'm inspired by what, like what's around me at this point. Um, I'll still get inspired by right now, um, movies and TV shows and stuff. And I, I love to see some of like the compositions and the way they're using light and color and stuff. And I'll try and like play on that. But in general, like I'm inspired by certain light that I see in a room or I'll find a clean composition and try and figure out how I can use that the best to the best of my ability. Or since a lot of our stuff is like documentary, I'll be inspired by like someone like the simple way someone's holding their hands and figure out how I can create an interesting composition with someone's twiddling fingers and stuff like that. Interesting. Do you feel like Chasney's is kind of in the same area or what do you feel like she does? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. We haven't yeah, talked I'm, about it recently. I'm curious. Have, just being, to ask her. Cause a lot of times people, uh, think of like, I want to own a studio. If I have a studio, then I'm going to be more inspired to go and create. And again, it really depends on like kind of knowing yourself because I'm the same way where like I'm, I'm inspired by locations I do a lot of studio work, but I find myself having to like really think about what it is that I want to do. Whereas like if I'm just out walking and moving, mm-hmm. I can find interesting things and objects and be inspired by like the light and the the shapes and, and the scenes and the architecture and stuff. And you can find things everywhere. It, it's almost like 10 to one, like to me, where like yeah. I, sitting in a studio trying to create versus just being out and observing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel the same. Like if I was primarily a studio shooter, I feel like I would have to be a little bit more in tune with inspiration and like trying to, because you're essentially just trying to create something out of a blank box. Whereas if you go travel around, there's so many things that you can use. But And I, lately I've actually started to um, browse a lot more um, studio photographers work. And I love the idea of trying to turn this like studio feel images into like location style work. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something that I've just kind of been like rolling around in my head a little bit. You know, one of my, my favorite, a friend of mine and one of my favorite photographers that does that incredibly well, uh, Clay Cook. Yeah. Have you seen Clay's? Cause he, he does a lot of those kind of location studio portraits mm-hmm. where he'll be in the middle of Africa and he'll drop a backdrop and, and show the backdrop in the image with mm-hmm. the surroundings and everything around it, kind of like how yours is set up right yeah, here. For sure. Um, and and I, I love that look. It's such an interesting aesthetic, like that he kind of brings the studio to these different locations, but then breaks that kind of barrier between the the viewer and the the scene and says, like, look, I'm showing you that this is a photo shoot. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really love that style, like the little, like this little backdrop, like out in the woods and you can see the lights and you can see the stands and stuff like you can get the tight where it looks just like the backdrop, but you can also pull back and kind of see this full landscape scene and stuff mm-hmm. like I really love that, that look now. And so I haven't got to the point where I like I'm toting this backdrop to a wedding, but I can see that possibly happening soon. I yeah, think it'd super be fun. Interesting. So what has 2020 looked like for you? Like we're, we're now into 2021 at the time of filming this and I imagine it's going to be released in a few weeks, but what happened in 2020 on your side and, and what's going into, how, how are you going into 2021? So 2020, um, we were fortunate enough that, so we were, we had our daughter towards the beginning, like right as, um, lockdowns and stuff started to happen where they're recommending like self quarantine and stuff like that. Um, and so we had already had this kind of downtime built into our schedule because we were, Mm -hmm. because we were going to have, have our daughter. And so whenever, um, bookings and stuff started getting rescheduled, like we didn't have a, we didn't have a ton that needed to be rescheduled around that time. And then the ones that, um, did need to be rescheduled, like it was easy to push them back into like towards the end of the year or into, we had like maybe two or three that pushed into 2021. Um, and so we maybe had, I want to say we had three three or four, um, that just straight up like canceled. Okay. And, but, but through that, we've also, we also picked up like four or five weddings from other photographers that couldn't reschedule their dates. And so the couple needed to find 
another photographer. And so we actually ended up essentially breaking even as far as number of weddings. And so it actually worked out um, fairly well as far as, as, far as wedding work. And then um, through the, through the uh, like just the, the downtime at home, like I did the 50 days of quarantine project with, mm -hmm. with our son that actually ended up, uh, the do our daughter came about halfway through that project. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and then that's kind of inspired me to start doing the family documentary stuff a little bit more. And, I've, and then I've always loved the family documentary stuff even before we had kids, but, um, it's just kind of cemented that idea of like, these are images that people should have. Um, so now I'm Maybe kind of diving through that a little bit. W what is family documentary when you're, when you're saying that? Walk okay. That. Yeah. So, um, the idea is I go and I hang out with a family and it's not a photo shoot. It's you just do your everyday activities. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, no directing. It's very much, um, I go by the, like the photojournalistic guidelines where I'm not going to like, I'm not even going to like turn a light on. I'm not going to move a water bottle. Like it's very much shoot what's happening and that's it. Um, and so the idea is to capture these moments that you don't necessarily know you're going to miss. Like mm -hmm. no one, no one makes the conscious decision of, I'm no longer going to read you a book before bed, but one day that, that just kind of fades away. Mm -hmm. And so same thing, like the, there's the saying of one day you're going to pick your kid up for the last time and not even know that it's happening. So the idea is to capture these little moments as they as they naturally unfold and then want, and you might not even cherish them whenever I deliver the album, but in 10 years, you're going to look back at this album and be like, oh, wow, this is what it was like in 2020 when we were having, oh, I remember when they used to play with that stuffed animal all the time. Where is that thing? I don't even know anymore. Um, and so it's, that's kind of like the idea is, is valuing real moments instead of these like fake, everyone gets dressed up and you bribe your kids. And, um, in general, mm -hmm. the husband scoffs and doesn't want to go. And so you have to bribe them too. And you, everyone gets in a line and smiles at the camera for 30 minutes in a park. And do you, do you suggest that, you know, these families, plan like like in our in our household like we love cooking together so mm -hmm. do you suggest that they usually have an activity that they normally do or do you because like if you were to come over to our house right now yen's working i'm at the studio and you know we have three right. kids in school so what what level of involvement do you kind of have in terms of like planning the best time to come do it so if it's like a weekday when people are generally working what i'll normally do is i'll plan it around like when they come home or like if the mom okay. or dad is a stay at home mom or dad, then I'll stay, I'll go with them for maybe an hour and catch the hour of just them. And then I'll capture mom or dad coming home from work. And then we'll go through all of the like dinner routines and bedtime routines and like going to sleep and stuff like that. And so there's not a lot that needs to happen because these are just, like, you're going to go through your normal routine. Whenever you get home from work, you're going to go through kind of your normal routine of hanging out with your kids for the day and eating dinner and getting ready for bed and stuff. If it's a weekend, um, we try, we don't necessarily like recommend them do an activity, but we try and say like, if there's something that you normally do on the weekends, like if you go, even if you just go to the grocery store together, like I'm going to go with you to the grocery store, I'm going to take mm -hmm. pictures of you trying to wrangle your kids as you go buy bacon. Um, we just recommend like, don't, don't go to a movie. Like don't, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but even yeah. then, like at the very end of the, uh, one that I, uh, was family session that I just did, um, a few weeks ago, they watched at, it was, um, towards the end of the night, they're winding down for bed and they, they sat down and watched home alone. And so I took pictures of like them watching the movie and stuff. And it's like, kids don't sit still. Like it's very rare for a kid to sit through an entire movie and just kind of like veg out. So it's like they had three kids, four kids. And so it's like one takes off to go do something mischievous. And so you follow that one and see what they're doing. And, um, or they're just cuddled up on the couch or start wrestling. And so little, little things always happen. The, the hard part has been teaching people that, one, that their moments are valuable and that they're interesting enough to have this type of photo shoot. Like most people that you talk to, they're like, oh, you don't want to come. They love the idea, but they're like, oh, you don't want to come photograph my family. We're boring. We don't do anything. But like kids are crazy. Kids are always yeah. doing something. So if you have kids that are in the age of zero to maybe like middle school, like they're always going to be doing something mischievous or playing or something. Uh, maybe high school kids, they get into like video games and stuff like that. Maybe not as much, but there's always usually something going on if you have kids, even if you think it's boring, it's just because you've lived that life every day. And to you, it's a monotonous thing. But in 10 years, that monotonous thing is going to be something that you value. 
I, I love it. I mean, from, but I, I also know what it is that you're trying to create and I know what it is you're trying to create because I've done it myself. And I can see that exact issue in terms of like trying to turn it into an actual successful product in a studio. It requires a lot of education and uneducation, like, like going in, you know, unteaching somebody what they think they know about what photography should be. But it almost takes these personal experiences. So I'm, I'm kind of curious the, the commercial success that you've seen in this because I learned the lesson through um, family road trips. So Yen and I, we, we do quite a few road trips um, each year. And on these road trips, we always plan uh, an actual one, one formal shoot with the kids. I'm usually shooting throughout the entire trip, but uh, there's always one formal shoot where we'll get the kids dressed up and it's more like so I can go out and just kind of have fun playing and creating something unique uh, from a portfolio standpoint. And um, all the images that we capture, like getting out to these photo shoots is always a train wreck. And it's always a bunch of like just <laughs> back and forth, like get this done. Why can't you get your like you get one kid dressed and then they're off playing in the mud and you're like, dude, I'm going to murder somebody. Why are your shoes off again? Keep your yeah. shoes on. <laughs> like how many times do I, I feel like a, like when it comes to shoes, man, I don't know what it is about shoes. Like put your shoes on. That has to be a phrase that I say like 30 times every time we're going out the door. Uh, but anyway, at the end of the day, when we, when we look back at the images, Yes, we captured some beautiful portfolio images, but the ones that Yen and I appreciate most are the chaotic moments that I'm shooting in between. It's like all right. the in-between moments that you wouldn't expect to be anything, but those are the ones that you cherish most. But I, I have that from that personal experience. Like I know that because of that experience. How do you convey it to a client and get them to spend money on something that they really have no idea about? Um, that's the hard part. So that's kind of like the road that I'm going down for 2021 is trying to get that, um, that education built or that marketing built where you can kind of convey what these sessions are about. And they, and it's for a certain type of person. Like if you're, if you're super worried about your house being clean and all that fun stuff, like this might not be the type of session for you because like, I don't want you to have to clean your house for me to come over. Like when you're, and also with these types of sessions, they're not necessarily for the parents. Like mm -hmm. this is for the kids and your kids' kids so that they can see like how their parents grew up. And your kids don't care that you needed to lose 10 pounds. Your kids don't care that the house is dirty and your kids don't care that your clothes don't match. Um, and so that's kind of like the message that I need to figure out how to convey to people. Um, I think you should yeah. do it just like that across right. the video. Like. <laughs> I, I think that's honestly what it needs to be. It needs to be a video where you can talk directly to the camera. You can literally say what you just said and then start walking through the the images that you create and what they mean to the people that you're creating. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, unless they can see it and touch it and feel it, you know, in some sort of a emotional capacity, mm -hmm. even hearing you explain it, it's it, but I, if it was set to the images that you're creating from it, then I would I would gain a picture, an understanding of what it is that what Jason's doing. But when you mm -hmm. describe it as a parent, I'm sitting there thinking of exactly what you said, like, oh man, the house is gonna be messy. You're gonna get all the stuff in the background, but that has that's not even in your images. Like you're framing those things out. You're choosing unique angles. You're you're still coming up with really interesting compositions, but they're storytelling images. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then in general, like all of, like the, 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 um, the end product is an album. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like these, these types of, yeah, you'll come out with images that you'll like, you'll be one. I want to print that and hang it on the wall. But in general, this is meant to go in a book and it's supposed to tell the story of your day. And so it, don't, it becomes a yearbook that you can look back and be like, oh, this is what it, life was like in 2020. And then you do it again in 2021 and you get this like volume of albums that show you what life was like and how life changed. I, I hope you can not only turn it into a product, I hope you can turn it into a trend. I think that would serve, <laughs> serve the industry very well. Yeah. And it's, it's been this, it's been kind of like a growing trend since I started photography and it's, but it's just something that it's hard because people want to have that, like that pretty picture that they can post on Facebook of like, this is our family. 
beautifully lit in a field. Not they don't necessarily like to show the chaos and the mm-hmm. craziness of your life. When in general, like those are actually the moments and the things that you're going to cherish. Like, yeah, I, I, I still think that like the traditional family portraits are important, but I feel like the real moments is what you'll actually want to remember. Kind of like you were talking about on the on your family trips. Yeah. And that's the issue is that we have this very skewed perception of what is, uh, of, of almost everything. We have a skewed perception of what life is. We have a skewed perception of what success is primarily due to social media and the, the curation of our lives. Like we, we curate, um, the 1%, right? Everybody posts Mm -hmm. the 1% of their, their lives that they were willing to show. And we're as, as photographers, it's almost like, a big part of our job and what we're creating for our clients is going and creating more 1% moments for them to post. And funnily, like I I have gotten, this is just how, how skewed. And the only purpose of this is like likes and comments. Like we're, we're aiming for likes and comments. And interestingly, I've gotten more, more people in the last week have reached out to congratulate me on my success. Do you know over what? Your TikTok, yeah, yeah, TikTok. I, I I I hit a million people on TikTok as if as if that's like a significant life accomplishment like gold, or something. It's a gold standard, yeah. <laughs> and it is an I, accomplishment, but <laughs> m- maybe an incredibly minor one on the grand, like on life on scale. scale life, this would yeah. be like at near the bottom of accomplishments. But I've gotten more people congratulating me on that in the past week than I've had anybody congratulate me on anything like added up together. Like having a kid like, or like having like a baby and stuff. <laughs> yes. Uh, having four children, uh, degrees like, you know, graduating college and getting my degrees, getting a good job, uh, building a few successful businesses that support 50 plus team members. I don't get congratulations on that. Like there's no success. There's no, like there's nobody that wants to talk to me because of that. Yeah. But I do have a lot of invitations to go and talk about how to grow your social media. Uh, it, it, and there lies the problem. It is. This is the exact issue, and that's exactly what you're battling against when it comes to like family documentary photographs. Mm-hmm. Because you're battling against this constant training of, of the mind of like the 1% moments or the moments that matter. Mm-hmm. And it's everything in between. It's the 99% in between that, that, that truly matters. Right. So good luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have, I have seen that it is becoming, I, I don't want to say it's become popular, but I've seen more and more of it. Um, I myself actually did a family documentary shoot with Shiv. I just said, Shiv, we like to cook together. We're going to cook this weekend. Um, come in and photograph it for a couple hours and it's some of my favorite images like they're just us cooking yeah so it's essentially the same thing but like an entire day yeah that's exciting man i'm i'm hoping that that goes really well mainly so i can do some more of them myself (laughs) (laughs) fly me out to california and i'll i'll shoot yours i will i will and if you are here we need to do one of these in person so Outside and away from photography, what are the things that you're actually like? I, I know you spend a lot of time with the family, but but doing what? What are your guys' favorite things to do? Oh, if it's summertime, uh, we pretty much go to the lake every weekend that we're not we're not busy. Okay, so, is that nearby? Yeah. Is it? Um, it's about thirty minutes. So yeah, it's close. Thirty forty five minutes, and uh, my wife's parents have a lake house with a dock, and so we can go out there and hang out on the dock and go swimming and go out on the boat and. Um, we like to go hiking and, um, mountain biking and all that fun stuff. That's right, man. But yeah, just all the, all the outdoor stuff. Well, I need to make a trip out there as well. I, it's absolutely gorgeous. I, I, I didn't realize what you guys had around you until I, I was looking at yours and, and miles as photographs and I was like, man, the Ozarks are insane. This is yeah, they're so beautiful. Gorgeous. So I definitely, I recommend coming out. I will, brother. Well, I appreciate you. Spring or summertime for sure. I will. Or fall. Fall is actually gorgeous here with all the changing colors and stuff. Yeah, it looks like we're going to be able to travel soon, not too long. So 
I'm definitely going to take you up on that. We probably will not grace your home with all six of us, but we will get it in a nearby Airbnb. <laughs> and uh, sounds good. <laughs> and yeah, dude, if you're out in California, um, let's let's bring you in the studio. And I also want to hire you to do a, a family shoot. So, okay, where in California are you again? I'm in Orange County. Okay, I have a wedding in Jenner, California. Let's look up where that is. I think we might be able to make that work. It's two hours north of San Francisco, I believe. Okay. That might not work. I have to fly you over here. Really It'd be a quick that's flight. That's really far away, isn't it? That's like, <laughs> that's like an eight-hour drive. Is it? Yeah, I have no idea. All right. So in the meantime, if you guys want to learn more about Jason's work, we're going to link up all of his work below. Well, depending on where you're listening or watching this thing, it'll be in the description. You can also check out Jason's Patreon if you want to learn directly from him and his awesome photography education. And that's it for us. So when we do that family shoot update, we will come back on another episode of the podcast. I'll let you guys know how it goes and uh, we'll show you guys some of the images if Jason can do a quick yeah. turnaround. You know, he's got the workflows down. Yeah. Okay. Or, and, or if they're good enough worth showing <laughs> they will definitely be worth showing <laughs> I hope alright we'll see you guys next time <laughs>